In today's American culture, Hollywood movies are a crucial part of our media. Top producers and directors have completely taken over the movie industry and show no signs of backing down. Each director and producer has their own way of filming, and they are all known for something different. One director, producer, and artist has made himself famous in the movie industry for his highly imaginative and creative movies along with the worlds he creates which in each film. His movies are all extremely detailed and contain consistent dark themes and settings. He's also known for stop motion animation. All throughout Burton's childhood, he felt like an outsider, and many of his characters in his movies reflect that loneliness that he's felt all his life. In high school, he didn't do well grade-wise. He had no motivation, no purpose, and no drive. He didn't find his school-learned skills to be useful to him in any way, so he decided to not pay attention to them. In fact, when he was in high school, he told his English teacher he didn't know how to read just so he could get out of a book-based project. After high school, Burton went to California Institute of the Arts, where he studied animation. A good intro to his animation process would be the 30-second short he made for the MoMA website. Burton sent his crew a few concept sketches of how he wanted the whole short to play out. His plan was for a quirky little robot to blow up a couple of Burton-esque balloons that spell out MoMA at the end. The time it takes to make a stop-motion puppet is about 12 to 18 weeks, but the team only had three weeks to make the whole short happen. The robot was easy to make, but the real problem was the balloons. They originally wanted to use aluminum balloons, but they would have to get it right on the first take or else they wouldn't meet their deadline. So the team started to brainstorm, and they got real balloons instead. They got the commercial done, but they still had to send it to Burton to make sure it was right. They finally got the okay, and it was ready to be sent into MoMA to be played on their website for the world to see. Tim Burton, age 54, started out as an animator at Walt Disney World Studios. He animated the feature film Fox and the Hound, but felt no desire to continue with the hand-drawn style that Disney was known for. Disney put him in conceptual art, where Burton had no passion for that either, so he left. He was finally able to break into the business by using stop-motion animation. The list of his animated movies is as follows. The Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride, Frankenweenie, and a few short movies such as Vincent and the original Frankenweenie, in which the full-length feature film was inspired by. During Burton's time at Walt Disney World Studios, he pitched the idea for The Nightmare Before Christmas, but it was shot down for being too dark and not child or family friendly. Tim Burton's Corpse Bride is a full-length feature film inspired by a Jewish folktale. The story is that a young man, Victor Van Dort, is forced into an arranged marriage to Victoria Everglot. The parents of each family put their child in this position to gain something. The Van Dorts want a higher status in society, and the Everglots want money. At first, both Victor and Victoria are terrified of marriage. During the rehearsal wedding, Victor forgets his vows and flees. He takes a walk in the woods, practicing the vows over and over again. When he finally gets them right, he puts Victoria's ring on what appears to be a tree branch, just to practice, when it actually turns out to be the decaying body of Emily, where she drags him down into the underworld with her. A tragic tale of romance, passion, I feel the same, and a murder most foul. Burton stated that it takes anywhere between 12 to 18 weeks to create a single puppet for a stop-motion movie. The time span may seem large and vague, but it really makes sense. In Corpse Bride, Victor's dead dog Scraps, whom he reunites with in Land of the Dead, is nothing but bone. Because his detail is easier to carry out, Scraps would take a lot less time creating than a character with a lot of detail. Take Emily, the corpse bride, for example. She's dead, obviously, so she can't look too human. Otherwise, you would never know she was dead. The animators have to get her decaying skin perfectly. They need her to show a little bone and make her clothes look ratty and worn out like she had been laying in the dirt bed for years, which, of course, she has. 
Tim Burton also has a very specific vision when it comes to his characters. They typically have extremely lanky bodies, tall and thin, and with strangely small feet. Their heads are easily the biggest part of their bodies. Unless they are given a grotesque facial feature, the standard Burton character has a small nose and a small mouth, but with large eyes. These eyes almost never have color, and they have noticeable dark circles under them. One of the best ways to describe them would be tired looking and maybe even lifeless. His female characters usually have tiny waists and large busts. Burton said that is because Corpse Bride took place in a time period where women wear corsets with their daily outfits, and corsets shrink the waist and push up fat to the chest area. He wanted to correctly portray the time period through clothing styles. In Corpse Bride, the land of the living is portrayed as dark, gray, and drab. None of the characters look happy, and there is nothing special. This was a fictional village in England during the Victorian era. The land of the dead, however, is ironically full of life, color, and even jazz. Everyone seems happy, and not one character resents death. In fact, one of the characters stated directly after his death, I feel great. However, in both locations, you can see that the animators never fell flat when it came to detail. Burton has stated on multiple occasions that he sees himself as a perfectionist, one detail-oriented perfectionist to be more specific. Unlike The Nightmare Before Christmas, Corpse Bride was not filmed on Disney property, let alone Disney sets. Corpse Bride was the first animated feature by Tim Burton that was not supported by Walt Disney Studios. Corpse Bride is one of the greatest examples for stop-motion animation to this day, even though the movie has been out for almost a decade. Tim Burton's imagination and creativity, along with the help of his animation team mixed together, created an instant box office hit. His stop-motion films have yet to disappoint, but Corpse Bride is the most critically acclaimed when it comes to the beautifully shot animation. I mean, it's incredible. But that's the amazing thing about the process, is that it is a real thing. Thing. I mean, the real sets, you know, the puppets are there, they're real, the lighting is all real, all the props are made, and that's the beauty of the process. It's like, you know, it's just made by just such an amazing group of artists, and that's what I think you do feel from it, you know, it's such a, and the technique really hasn't changed since the beginning of cinema, really, so it's, 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 there's a real beautiful quality to but that. But what happens, though, if you're setting up and you're, so many things are going on, how many people are involved in, the, in like, in an average scene? Well, it depends on, you, you know, I mean, there's, it's kind of like a live action film. I mean, there's the cameraman and they've got a light, the, a couple of lighting guys, and then it depends on, you know, there's usually one animator working on his particular or her particular shot. I mean, and sometimes where it gets difficult is that there's several characters in the shot at the same time. Have, it, have you gotten into situations, though, where it, after you've done and hours later or something, you find out that something didn't work and you've got to go back and do it again? Or? Well, I think there was a couple of shots that that happened. But, you know, shooting with digital cameras, the animators can now kind of go frame by frame and kind of see where they're going, you know. So, like in the old days, I mean, you just shoot it, you know, not really knowing, and then kind of get it the next day and see what you got. It's a gotten a little bit more where you can kind of see where you're going with it. But, you know, it's like a performance. You, you know, it takes a long time. You know, live action, you can take two, three, or four. Right. This, you can't. What about, the, how, how is it different from working on Nightmare to this? I mean, how has it evolved? Um, I, I know when you said digital, because I don't think you you use digital the cameras. Right? And the cameras, yeah, yeah, But really, I think the really the only other real major difference on this was the sort of sophistication of the puppets. I, I mean, a nightmare. We use a lot of what we call replacement heads, where you know the, you just change heads over for you know facial things. This one, all the mechanics were like built in the head. So you know, because the story was was a bit more subtle, you know, the sense of... Trying also, to the, so the, the, the characters, like, they had, like, lo robot eyes or something? Yeah, or or like, like, literally, you had to stick a wrench in the ear to no move way. the mouth, you know, or, or to move the, 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 you know, the brow and stuff. So, so there was a lot more sort of sensitivity in terms of how these puppets were Now, going. you had um, two different worlds here, the, the, the dead world and the alive world, but I know everything was screwed up in the, in the dead world. I mean, it was like, I don't, I don't even know how to describe it, but it just sounded like, I don't know, was it, was it the goal, everything to be the opposite? Cause yes. Yeah, is that, yeah. oh. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was sort of symbolic to me of how I grew up, where the, le were, you know, the sort of society feeling quite repressive and, you know, like everything in its place and, you know, everybody put into a category 
you know, which is the way I felt sort of growing up. And then the Land of the Dead was sort of symbolically representative of your creative mind, which is much more colorful and much more vibrant and, you know, much more visual stuff going on. So it wasn't meant to be so literal as it was to be sort of that symbolic.